Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our talk. Um, this is Laurent, I'm Antoine, uh, we are both engineers at Datadog. And today we are going to talk about networking and service discovery. Uh, so I'll start with a few words about Datadog for those that don't know us. Uh, we are an observability product um, with a bunch of integrations. Uh, we have quite a large customer base already and because of that, um, we have a pretty big infra in, in order to store and query all this data. Uh, Laurent is going to start by introducing a bit more about our infra, uh, and that's going to be useful for the rest of the talk. Yes, before we dive into the purpose of the talk, which is service discovery, to give you context and the constraints we have, uh, we're going to present um, a quick history of our infra. So back in 2018, Datadog was running in a single region on AWS, and everything was managed with Chef and Capistrano. As we were reaching thousands of nodes, this started to be a challenge. In addition, we had new customers in Europe. We wanted us to send data to Europe. And this got us the first, one of the first big infra projects we did, which was creating a new region on a new provider. And because we were seeing limits with Chef, we started to deploy with Kubernetes instead of uh, Chef in Europe. As you can see on this slide, we also started to do this in, in the initial region in the US, but only a small part of it was running on Kubernetes at the time. Fast forward to 2024, this is far more complex, right? We're running in six different regions uh, on three different providers, everything is running in Kubernetes, and, and we run millions of containers. What's important for this talk is we run thousands to tens of thousands of nodes in each region. Which means, of course, because of limits in Kubernetes, that we need to have multiple clusters in regions. And in some regions, we have dozens. And what really matters for what we're going to discuss today are these three things. The fact that we're 100% Kubernetes, that we run on three different providers, and that regions can have up to dozens of clusters. If we zoom in into a region, because we have many clusters, we need to assign workloads to clusters. And in this very simple example here, we can, we can see three different clusters one that is dedicated to metrics application, one that is dedicated to logs application, and a third one that is dedicated to shared services, such as Kafka or Cassandra. This looks simple enough, but for reliability and scalability reasons, we tend to deploy stateless workloads in zonal clusters, right? So you can see here that instead of having a single metrics cluster in the region, we actually have one in each zone. This gives us increased reliability because if the cluster fail, if a cluster fails, it means we still have two clusters to run the workloads. And also it aligns failure domain, right? Like the failure of a zone of the cloud provider tends to have a similar effect as losing a cluster. Of course, this mostly works for stateless services. If you have stateful services that are coordinated, such as Kafka or Cassandra, it's much easier to run them in regional cluster. So we have a mix of zonal and regional clusters. Now that we have an idea of how we run things, of course, because we have many applications, they need to talk to one another, and this means service discovery. And before diving into how we do things, we're now going to give you a, a quick uh, overview of how it works in, in Kubernetes in general. So when you start deploying a service and exposing an application in Kubernetes, the first thing you're going probably to do is to create a service with a default configuration, and it's going to be a cluster IP service. And the way cluster IP services work is as follows. So first, if we have an intake pod that wants to reach the storage pod of the storage application, the intake pod is going to make a DNS query. So here it's querying for storage. And DNS is going, is going to give an answer that is a cluster IP. And what's important here is that the cluster IP is actually a virtual IP. It's not the IP of one of the pods. You can see here that pods have IPs in 10 dot something, while the virtual IP is in 172. Of course, because the intake pod got this answer, it's now sending the traffic to the virtual IP, which has to be translated into the IP of a pod for the traffic to reach the storage pods. And this is done with a proxy. So I use proxy here because there are multiple ways to do this. Um, it's usually IP tables or IPVS, and more and more eBPF. And for this proxy to be configured, so the component that is transforming virtual IP into pod IP, you have multiple solutions. The, the classic one was to use kubeproxy, and more and more people use Cilium. This is what, what we do. So cluster IP services are, are great, right? They're magic because clients always see a single IP. 
that's extremely convenient because they don't have to care about the number of backends, the fact that this backend will scale up and down, the fact that sometimes it will be unreachable. Everything is, is totally masked to the application. They just see the single IP. However, it, it's not perfect. And here is an example of issues you can get with cluster IPs. So in this example here, we have 10 gRPC servers and 100 gRPC clients sending 100 requests per second to these servers. And of course, these graphs are representing the number of requests received by the servers and the CPU of the servers. And you would expect this to be balanced, right? You would expect all the backends to get the same, same number of queries. Turns out it's very different. So it's, it's pretty confusing. And, and the reason this happens actually is because of the way gRPC works. If, G, if a gRPC client sees a single IP for a service, it's going to consider that, that there is a single backend and it will establish a single connection on which it will send all the traffic. So each client is connected to a single backend. The problem is if you have 10 backends and 10 clients in that example that each pick a backend, it's pretty much running uh, um, a, a, ten, a 10 dice. Um, and you can see here that some backends will get uh, three clients and some backends will get none. Of course, it's only with 10 clients. If you have more clients, it's slightly better, right? This is a distribution of number of clients connected to each server if you have 100 clients. So it's better, but you can still see a huge discrepancy between backend four with six clients and backend six with 18. So as a summary, cluster IP services are magic in many ways, but the problem is clients have no control over load balancing and widely used applications rely on this, right? In addition, some applications even rely on the fact that they can see all the backends and this is true for Cassandra or Kafka, for instance. So, Cluster IP services are the default service in Kubernetes, but an option you can have is you can transform these services into headless services which are designed to address this issue. And the way they work is, is very similar, except you're going to see here that when you do the DNS query, instead of getting a virtual IP as an answer, we're getting the IP of all the backends, right? So the client gets all the IPs and then it's responsible for connecting to the different pods. So it's much simpler. You can see here that the intake pod is directly sending traffic to storage pod one and with no, with no proxy. So it's better in our case, right? But of course, it means the client has to load balance and the client has to handle everything the proxy was handling before, which is manage healthiness of, uh, of the backends uh, and staleness of the, of the endpoints when you're scaling up and down. However, it addresses the main challenge we, we had with cluster IPs. You can see here that we migrated a service from cluster IP to a headless service around 1 p.m. and suddenly the traffic is perfectly balanced. So this solution is much better. However, it's still single cluster, right? So what happens if we want to send traffic across clusters? So there are multiple ways to do this and we're going to talk about the two main ones in Kubernetes which are load balancer services first, and, and then we'll talk about another one. I won't spoil you. <laughs> so load balancer services allows you to expose services across clusters. So the only difference from the slide we had before, from the step we had before, is that in this case, we have the intake workload running on one cluster and the storage workload working on another one. So they can't rely on standard services. When you use load balancer services, what's going to happen is your client workload is going to do a DNS query, but instead of getting the IP of a virtual IP in the cluster or the IP of the pod, it's going to get the IP of a load balancer back. And the traffic is going to be sent to this load balancer, which is usually managed by the cloud provider. However, this load balancer doesn't know how to reach pods, right? So this load balancer has to send traffic to, to nodes. So what happens is all the nodes in the cluster are registered with the load balancer and then the pod server we were talking about before is going to be responsible for sending traffic to the actual pods. So you can see that the data path is a bit complex. The intake pod as a client is connected to the load balancer, which is sending traffic to any node, and the proxy is responsible to send traffic to the actual pod. Of course, this is a full mesh, so you have connections all over the place, and it's, it's pretty complex. It's pretty inefficient because you have multiple hubs, and, and also you can end up in a situation where you have noisy neighbors because, of course, if you have a high throughput traffic uh, and you're, uh, you can hit node three there uh, for traffic that is destined, that is that you want to send to pod one. And of course, you're sending traffic that is unneeded to, to, the, to the third node. 
So this can be slightly improved uh, in Kubernetes by using load balancer service with the external traffic policy local annotation, right? And this is designed so only nodes that actually run the backend you want to talk to are going to be healthy in the load balancer. So you can see here that traffic is never crossing nodes boundary. Traffic will, reach, will only reach nodes where storage pods are running and be load balanced by the proxy. So it's better, but it's, it's still not perfect, right? Because nodes are still registered with the load balancer, and the only reason some nodes are not getting traffic is because they're not considered healthy. Which means we have an additional component, which I call the health checker on the slide, that is responsible for probing all the nodes to see if they're running one storage pod. So load balancer services allow us to get traffic between clusters, but they create a lot of unneeded traffic. Of course, there's also additional costs because you have to pay for the load balancers. It still doesn't work for workloads where the client has to see all the backends because of course you only see the load balancer. And, and something I wanted to highlight, which made it a complete no-go at Datadog, is there's a strong limit we discovered the hard way which is there's only so many nodes you can register with a load balancer, like every provider will have its own limits, which means if you, if you get higher, if you have more than X nodes in your cluster, you won't be able to use them. To avoid this, it's actually one of the only features we completely disable in our Kubernetes clusters to make sure we don't have incidents. So I mentioned that load balancer was one of the way you could get traffic between clusters. Another way to do it is to use ingresses. So we're back to the same setup we had before, and if you want to use an ingress, the way it's going to work is, in addition to your workloads, you're going to have load balancers. So in that example here, uh, I used Nginx or HA proxy, but you have many other options. And what ingress allows is, when they get HTTP traffic, they can route traffic to backend services based on the HTTP host or based on the path you use. However, you can, you can see here that there's a bit of a challenge because these workloads are very clever within the cluster, but we still need to get traffic to these proxies, right? To this ingress. And the way it is usually done is to use a load balancer service, right? And as I told before, it's not great. There they actually are alternative options. So if you run on, on, on cloud providers, they tend to provide native solutions to this problem. And, and for instance, in that case, what's going to happen is the load balancer, instead of sending traffic to nodes, is going to send traffic directly to the pod IPs, right? And so you have options on, on multiple providers, the way it works, you have a controller running in your cluster that is watching for services and pods and programming the load balancer. So a quick summary on, on, on ingresses. The first one is they're limited to HTTP, right? So it's, uh, it's a bit of a challenge, of course. By default, they use load balancer services, which is ungreat. And, and there are cloud native options to route, to route directly to pods, which, is, which are much better. However, and you remember that in the very first uh, part of the presentation, I was talking about multi-cloud. The fact that you run on multiple providers means the native implementation is going to be different across providers. And also, these implementations will have, will have limits, right? Because you need to call the API to program the load balancers every time uh, pod chains, right? If you have new pods, if pods become an LC, you need to call the cloud provider and say, oh, program this IP, add, the, add this IP, or remove this IP. This can very easily trigger rate limits, which means it will take time for changes to propagate back to, to the load balancer and the clients. And what we have to acknowledge is lo cloud load balancers are great, but they are definitely not designed for high pod churn when you reprogram them on a frequent basis. So, the, the two solutions we, we've discussed to expose services across clusters rely on proxies and load balancers. What if we could do it without it? So there's another solution to expose services across cluster, which we've used extensively, and this solution is called external DNS. And the way this solution works is you have a controller in your clusters that, are, that is also watching endpoints and, and services and updating the cloud DNS entries, right? So, in, for instance, Cloud DNS or Route 53. When a client wants to connect to one of the storage pods, it's going to get the IP back, right? So, the IP that have been programmed by the controller. And as you can see here, this is extremely similar to what we had with uh, headless services. So, it's very similar, 
but there's a strong constraint here, right? It seems very simple on the slide. You have the client pod directly connected to the backend. But of course, because it's connecting to the IP of the backend, it means the IP of the backend has to be addressable from the other cluster, which is a constraint on the way you, you design your community clusters. In our case, uh, we give native IPs of the underlying VPCs to pods, which we achieve with Cilium, and this allows for this type of communications. Once again, these are similarities with challenges we had with uh, load balances, because then again, we have to uh, we have to program the DNS of the provider, which means we, we can hit rate limits if we, if we change things too fast. Uh, I gave a good example here, which is the propagation latency is usually pretty good, around a minute, right? But you can very easily get above 10 minutes as soon as you ha start hitting the rate limits, which is a pretty long time. Once again, the DNS API of providers are not designed to do this. So what we wanted to say, though, uh, for this solution in particular is I mentioned the challenges we had with it. However, it got us pretty far. I mean, we ran that for, for many years, probably three or four years, before the limit I was starting to mention started to hit us too, too hard and, and we had to change. And I let Antoine talk about the, the other alternative we considered before diving into the solution we actually put in place. Okay. okay, so at this point, you're probably wondering, have those people heard about service meshes? And it turns out we, we have evaluated this solution. Um, so just a quick reminder, this is the example that uh, Laurent was presenting with intake pods and storage pods. I'm going to tell you uh, what uh, service meshes, how service meshes work. Uh, so typically, you have a main container uh, that knows how to do networking. This is the application that um, developers have written and are running in Kubernetes. Um, and the idea of ser service meshes is that you, you're going to inject a sidecar container uh, that is going to take care of pod networking uh, needs. Um, the, the sidecar container will connect to a control plane uh, that itself uh, sources uh, data such as endpoint data, um, like IP addresses, uh, from the Kubernetes API. Um, so what do we expect to gain from this pattern? Uh, so first of all, so one thing is it's independent of cloud providers, so uh, you don't have these problems with rate limits and things like this. Uh, it's also transparent, um, so in theory you don't have to touch your application and it will just work out of the box. Uh, and then it gives you a bunch of neat things, like, such as traffic management uh, and load balancing. So that would alleviate the problems that we saw with gRPC before. Um, the problem, uh, like the thing for us, is that we actually already had invested in quite a lot of infrastructure in order to um, make sure that um, traffic for, for example, for our Kafka workloads are uh, assigned to the right pods and so on. And so this would have kind of interfered with it, and we didn't think we would benefit that much from those features. Um, also, like we use he we're heavy users of gRPC, and gRPC has built this feature built in. Um, another advent uh, another upshot of, um, of uh, service meshes is observability. But as it turns out, Datadog already has great observability, both into applications and in the infrastructure. And this is not really something that we, like adding a new thing in order to take care of observability just didn't really seem like the right thing to do. Um, and the last big selling point of service meshes is transparent uh, TLS and MTLS. And here, again, uh, some of our applications already had that uh, configured and built in. And like that would have been, you would have had uh, TLS twice, uh, which is not really needed. So all of these are very useful features. Uh, but for us, they just seem a bit redundant. Um, service meshes also come f with some downside. One of them is general debuggability. Um, so when users, it, it, it's great when it works, but when it doesn't work, um, users tend to be confused a little bit because there's an ad additional moving part. Another big one is resource management. Um, so at the bottom of this uh, slide, you can see the distribution. This is actually taken from our own managed sidecars that we have internally that, um, and like, I'm not gonna get into details here, but we do use sidecars for some specific cases and it runs about on about 5% of our infrastructure. Um, and we, here I captured the resource usage from all these sidecars and as you can see, at the top, there are, some of them are using almost up to two cores. Some of them are, like most of them are actually, like the red line at the bottom is, uh, this is a heat map, 
So the red line at the bottom means like most of the workloads are there. They are using zero, close to zero. Uh, so how you're going to size that is tricky um, unless you make service owners have to do it, which is like one more thing they have to care about. Um, so yeah, if you, if you provision for the top here, like you're going to waste a ton of cores. You don't want to do that. So uh, there's also an inherent cost at um, having an additional user land network up. Um, here, this is captured from, from something that is supposed to advertise uh, Linkerd's performance. I think Linkerd's performance are great, as you can see. Like this is a green line. Um, the green line, sorry. Uh, Istio is uh, in gray. It shows that the additional latency from uh, the sidecar is lower on Linkerd. But really, if you make me choose, choose between the baseline Linkerd or Istio here, I, I'll do my best to make the baseline work. Really. So yeah, in, in many scenarios, it won't matter because you don't have many hops. But uh, we tend to have lar large fan outs with services. And so uh, a given call to serve a user request is going to hop many times within our in uh, infrastructure through many applications. And each time, you're going to pay this, um, this, this hit. Like th we, we think this was not really acceptable for us. Um, so some of the service me mesh vendors have acknowledged the problems that uh, you may face with sidecars, and it's being addressed in a vari variety of ways. Uh, one way is to just make the proxy as white, lightweight as possible. Uh, that's what Linkerd does. Um, Cilium uses an L7 proxy on each node, for example, which um, reduces the overall resource consumption because it's shared through multiple pods, so it's a bit cheaper. But then they are concerned about isolation here. And then sizing, again, is, is not that obvious. Uh, Istio has ambient mesh that is advertising now. It's still like kind of early phase. Uh, but uh, it uses an L4 pro proxy on each node, which is, again, supposed to be very lightweight, um, but still prone to like isolation problems and things like that. Um, and then again, like uh, also Istio, with Istio, you lose the L7 um, features if you do that because their Z tunnel is, is only um, doing L4, um, like taking care of L4 concerns such as MTLS and thing, things like this, but not of like request routing and all these fancy, fancy features. So for this, they actually had a weapon proxy which adds another, potentially another network up. Um, how about multi-cluster? So um, this is a service mesh in a, in a, sen a single cluster. Um, usually, what they offer you to do is to uh, mesh clusters together. So you will go on each cluster and tell them what all other clusters are. Um, and this works well is you, you just have a few clusters. But when you have dozens, as we do, uh, it gets really difficult to manage. Um, one thing that you may have run into also with, um, with um, service meshes, which we did when we actually evaluated uh, some of them, um, was a few years ago, um, was uh, the high RAM need for sidecars. Uh, because usually what they will do is load the entire mesh. Uh, if you have thousands of services, as, as we do, um, the data plane is just going to go crazy on memory. Um, and even CPU, because it has to constant, constantly handle the churn in, in, in services. Um, so there are ways to change that, but it, they, they actually require additional configuration. Um, so yeah, in, in summary for uh, service meshes, um, it provides many features, but uh, many of them can be handled by applications. Uh, the sidecars are kind of complex, uh, and they have a cost, uh, both financial, cognitive, and in terms of performance. And then there are sidecarless solutions. Um, but um, s some of them are very early stage. Um, maybe the one to mention is gRPC proxyless, which completely eliminates uh, any proxy, which is an interesting approach, actually. Uh, but it's only gRPC. And then for multi-cluster, uh, solutions are also kind of young and hard to manage. So at this point, you're probably wondering, like, if they don't use a service mesh, if they don't use the built-in uh, cube primitives, then what, what do they use? Uh, turns out we built our own. Um, so we had the following requirements uh, when we built our service discovery solution. It had to work across clusters. It had to enable uh, direct pod discovery. It had to merge endpoints from multiple clusters because we, we have services that actually span multiple clusters. Um, and it had to 
ideally require minimal application changes because we were a bit under pressure to replace external DNS that was causing problems. Um, and yeah, the things that I didn't say is it has to be better uh, than external DNS at, at, at dealing with things like um, AP, um, API weight limits from cloud providers. Okay, so this brings us to Datadog's DNS system. Um, back to our two applications. Uh, the way it works is that uh, we run controllers in each Kubernetes uh, cluster. So when we install a cluster, we just install the, this, this additional controller on it. It goes and registers in a central backing store, which is hosted in one of the Kubernetes clusters. And it just um, watches endpoints from the, their own Kubernetes API and will register them uh, into, into the backing store. Uh, so this is the layout that we have in this data store. Uh, we just write IP addresses or associated to uh, the, the namespace and service um, of, of these IPs. And then we um, install DNS servers on the, um, on the Kubernetes clusters, and they will be able to serve queries um, based on, on the service name across clusters. Uh, so what happens when uh, we want to do inter-service communication here is that typically the intake pod will query DNS for the storage service. Uh, DNS will return the list of IPs, and then it can just directly connect to, to, to the pods based on their IPs. Um, so one thing that is uh, particularly useful for us is the ability to, I was saying, about, um, to, to merge endpoints from multiple clusters. And so, um, for example, the storage system might span multiple clusters. We do that for isolation, actually, for some of our systems. Um, we run zonal clusters, and some systems span, span multiple of them. Um, and so here, as you can see, uh, you can have a query for like the mat matrix storage that is, uh, has pods in both clusters, and it will ret return all the, all the IPs. We also attach additional metadata to each endpoint. Uh, so here I gave the example of the availability zone, which lets users actually um, query a, a service in a given AZ. Uh, we use that in order to keep the traffic zonal and do that kind of things uh, that can save on costs and also make reliability better in certain cases. Uh, yeah, one thing that I wanted to address is that uh, ETCD sounds like kind of a dangerous thing to run here. Uh, so the way we address that is we actually run multiple um, instances of this stack, uh, one per AZ, and this gives us um, sufficient redundancy that if we have a problem with one of them, for example, because we want to do an upgrade or something like this, uh, we will be able to, to use the others. Um, we have multiple layers of, of, of cachings in, in order to... Um, to serve the high traffic of DNS queries that we have. Uh, so I think the most interesting one here is that we have a node local cache uh, for all queries. This is very useful because some applications, like they're not all perfect, and some, some of them can go a bit crazy on DNS queries. Uh, so that, at that layer, we typically manage to isolate um, the nodes from each other, and this, this really limits the blast radius in case one application uh, tries to, like, DOS, the DNS server. So, um, the, our, our custom discovery system, uh, so it's been in production for a few years now, and uh, it's been working really well. We've had no outage uh, whatsoever, uh, and it's alleviated all the problems we had with external DNS and also enabled new use cases. Um, so if, if you've been following the CNCF ecosystem in the last few years, uh, you're probably wondering, like, can you do better than DNS? Um, DNS is very primitive. Uh, basically, you give it a name, or is that true for AI records? You can do all sorts of crazy things with DNS, but clients usually don't support it, so you're not really gaining anything from that. Um, but in the normal case of AI record, you, you give it a name, and it will give you a bunch of IP addresses. Um, some data planes have another service discovery protocol that they're trying to uh, standardize, which is called XDS, which has a much richer data model. Uh, for example, um, beyond the DNS um, interface that we saw, uh, it can also group IPs by localities and priorities. You can do failover between them. You can do all sorts of interesting things. Uh, this is actually what service meshes use, uh, or not all of them, but Istio at least, um, and the Envoy-based one. 
in order to do things like traffic splitting, for example. And then you can configure like the security policies and like a lot of things through this API. Uh, but this doesn't, doesn't uh, like, this is only, first, this is only available for Envoy and gRPC. So this is quite limited, actually. Um, and also, this doesn't address scalability at all. Um, XDS is push-based compared to DNS that is pull-based, but honestly, like, you're not going to get a lot of um, improvements based on that. You're just going to save a bit of bandwidth on control plane. Um, so if you remember the DNS design, we, we do use XDS, actually, uh, with exactly the same layout. We use, we use the same data. Uh, we have a custom XDS control plane. Um, in, and, and we use it for a couple of cases, such as to configure the Envoy sidecars that I talked about, about before. Uh, we use it to configure our edge load balancers and our internal load balancers. We have some of them. In some cases, they are useful. Um, and we are rolling out using it directly from gRPC client uh, for more advanced use cases. And, and we offer a custom API uh, for our internal users. It kind of resembles the gateway API, really. We get a lot of inspiration out of it. Okay. So the, the solution Antoine presented sounds simple. It sounds, it sounds great. Um, but of course, as you can imagine, there are trade-offs. And the question is, what's the catch? So the key thing is it's, it's actually not that simple, right? Because sending all the IPs of the backend to the clients mean that the logic has to be implemented and tuned into clients because the defaults will usually not do what you want, right? For instance, if you give five IPs to some client, they will only connect to the first one, which is not what you do, what you want to do. And this means a lot of things, right? Uh, we mentioned before that service meshes were providing a lot of features. Uh, cluster IPs were hiding a lot of the complexity. And if you do it yourself, like, like we do, it means the client has to do it, right? You have to support and provide observability. You have to detect stale endpoints. You have to do load balancing in a way that is uh, efficient. And of course, help check the backends because sometimes they will be discovered, but they won't be reachable. And if you want to do authentication and TLS, you have to do that too. In addition, you have to do this for all the protocols you want to support, right? In our case, we use a lot, we use gRPC pretty heavily, but we also have some HTTP. And if you have other uh, services, you need to support them to Kafka, for instance. And, and finally, well, you have to do this in every single language you run, right? In our case, it's mostly Go, Java, and Python, but we're seeing more and more Rust. And this means we have to implement this for all the clients in, in all these languages. So this, this, is, this works, and we currently run this, but this works because we have Antoine's team working on it, and that is owning the libraries for all these languages and making sure that they do the right thing in an efficient way. And this is getting us to our, our conclusion, right? So if we, we want you to, to remember a few things from this talk uh, in a few lines, well, the first thing is Kubernetes native service discovery primitives work very well as long as you remain within a cluster, right? So with cluster IPs and headless services, you should be able to address most of your use cases. However, as soon as you start having multiple clusters, this is much more challenging, right? I I mentioned load balancer services and ingresses. They will help, but they they, they feel a bit hacky, especially if you have many clusters and high throughput applications. And of course, Kubernetes primitives don't integrate with non-Kubernetes services. What if we want to expose services that don't run in Kubernetes? It's very difficult to use with Kubernetes primitives, of course. Service meshes are up promising because they want to, add, to hide a lot of this complexity. But of course, the trade-off is they come with their own complexity in terms of deployment, debuggability, and, and cost, right? Uh, for some of our applications, it will be totally impossible for us to run with a sidecar just because it could almost double the cost of running the infra. So in the end, uh, we ended up building our own service discovery that is independent of, of Kubernetes, which is both good and bad, right? Bad because we have to do it ourselves and and good because it means we can go, we, we don't have limits around uh, Kubernetes boundaries. Of course, we still heavily use Kubernetes for information about endpoints and services. And finally, and this is what I was hinting at just before, is this works because we heavily rely on our clients being, being smart, right? So we're removing anything smart from the network and we're moving everything in the, in the clients.
And, and this is it, so uh, thank you very much. If you're interested in this topic, we always hire. And if you have questions for us, I think it's going to be a bit hot right now. Maybe we can get one question. And, but you can reach out to us either by email or on Slack, and we'll be around for, for the rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>